Did you get along with the other kids at school? Did you feel like just a regular kid? Australia is similar to America, but in one sense quite different. In America, there's a fair amount of prominent families. In Australia, there's definitely money. But when I was growing up, you know, I went to a, a good private boys' schools. And so the other kids, their dads or parents might have been stockbrokers or lawyers or what have you. But they weren't even close to in the same league in terms of money or status. And Australia being a very egalitarian society, which in a lot of ways is good, if you're successful in anything other than sports, they kind of want to bring you down, <laughs> you know? So it's like, oh, so, so you think you're better than us. So how many cars do you have? And my dad loved cars, so I stupidly answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. Hope you're having a great day because, well, it's the only one you've got. Might as well make the most of it. We're going to talk today on this podcast that is about work, money, success, and meaning and figuring out what we want from life. We're going to talk about something that many of us achievement-oriented people don't want to lock eyes with. It's something that we avoid like a party guest that has chives in his teeth and chronic halitosis. It's a thing that we worry, perhaps, that we wouldn't be able to survive it. What is that thing? That thing is called failure. Failure, the real F word, ladies and gentlemen. This is our second week in a row talking about failure. I think we can call it failure. And I think we can talk about the fact that it's survivable. My guest is Warwick Fairfax. He's got an incredible story that when I heard just the snippet of, I couldn't wait to talk to him. And it follows up our conversation last week with Ali Partovi, who told the story of misspeaking, one might say lying, to Steve Jobs in a meeting where Apple was going to buy their company, I Like, in 2008. Ali was very kind to share with great vulnerability his experience and the lessons he's learned from it. And I was doing some math just today to figure out how big a mistake $50 million in Apple stock would be today. And Apple was trading for about $7 a share in 2008. Today, it trades for over $160 per share. So you're looking at like a 21, 22x appreciation in that time. So it wasn't a $50 million mistake. It was like a billion dollar mistake in today's Apple money. But anyway, we're not going to, we're not going to dwell on that. The point is these were big mistakes and Ali's, you know, he shared it publicly many years later, but the mistake we're going to talk about today with Warwick Fairfax was a very public mistake. It was big, it was flagrant, and it earned him the derision of the press decisions that he made cost members of his family, hundreds of millions of dollars at least. And that's in 1987 dollars, and that would be double that today. Let me tell you a little bit about Warwick Fairfax. In 1987, at the age of 26, Warwick Fairfax was the heir apparent to run John Fairfax Limited, an Australian newspaper and media conglomerate that owned the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age in Melbourne, and the Australian Financial Review, as well as other valuable media properties. With corporate raiders lurking, Warwick took on massive leverage and launched a $2.25 billion bid to take control of this 150-year-old company that had been founded by his great-great-grandfather. It was a public company, but the family still owned about half the stock. As he'll explain, this is the era of the leverage buyout, the aggressive corporate raiders, and there was chum in the water that these raiders were coming to take over the part of the company that his family owned, and Warwick didn't want that to happen. He believed that his company was founded on the right kind of ideals. He wanted the family to maintain control and continue to foster those ideals of objective journalism and keep the company out of the hands of, let's say, less idealistic corporate owners. Well, three years later, under Warwick's leadership and due largely to the weight of the debt that he sanctioned, the company went into receivership, bringing to an end his family's media dynasty, just shy of its sesquicentennial. That's right. I got bicentennial. I got sesquicentennial. I know it. 150 years. Warwick's got a new book out. It's called Crucible Leadership, and it is full of valuable lessons of how to deal with failure. And I'm sorry I'm putting it in such stark terms, but that's what we're talking about today. Failure is a part of life. It is very difficult to deal with it. And Warwick is putting himself on the line, just as Ali did last week, to say, here's what happened. Here's why I think it happened. Here's what I can learn from it. Here's how I forgave myself and how you might survive and move on from failures you experience in life. 
because failure is perhaps the end of one thing, but it's also the beginning of your life after that moment. Warwick's story is incredible because he grew up in an atmosphere of incredible wealth. He had lots of eyes focused on him as the heir apparent, and he shares great insights as to what that's like. Spoiler alert, the rich kids don't always have it as easy as you might think. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Warwick Fairfax. Warwick Fairfax, welcome to Crazy Money. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, Great to be here. Warwick, what was John Fairfax Holdings Limited, and who is the John Fairfax to whom the company name refers? John Fairfax, actually my day was John Fairfax Limited, and it's sort of evolved, but John Fairfax was my great-great-grandfather. He came out from England in the late 1830s, and he founded in 1841 what was to be a very large uh, media company. So he was a person of faith, really a great guy in so many ways. He founded a successful business, and in terms of having money and status, he's, from my perspective, the gold standard of how to do it right. He was a good husband, great dad. His employees loved him. You know, this is the 1800s. There were precious little you know, worker rights legislation. It was pretty much a free-for-all in most countries back then. You could kind of do what you wanted. But when he died, his employees said, we've lost a valued friend, a beloved employer. I mean, who says that about their boss in the 1800s? So, you know, he really was somebody I admire greatly. And uh, so he's the guy that founded it 150 years before in 1841. So pretty amazing guy. And this was in Sydney, Australia. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. It grew from there to be a very large media company at its height. It had TV, radio, newspapers, magazines. Uh, It had the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age in Melbourne, and the Australian Financial Review, which was the equivalent in U.S. terms of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. A massive media company, 750-odd million in revenue, 4,000-plus employees. It was huge, but it was really all started by John Fairfax and his vision. I know there's all sorts of things in the media these days, HBO succession and all. But he was just different than what you see on TV and in the, in the movies and what he founded. The newspapers in Sydney Morning Herald, it was always an independent newspaper. In fact, the current masthead below, which is years since we controlled it, says independent always. So the original masthead or motto of the paper was may Whigs call me Tory, Tory call me Whig, which in modern language is may liberals call me conservative, conservative call me liberal. So it's always strove to be an independent paper. You could be a prime minister, some wealthy business person. The papers would always treat you like anybody else. No favors were given, no backhanded, you know, favors for your mates, as some people say in Australia. He's just a mate. So we kind of treat him a bit differently, right? Because, you know, he's a mate of mine. Well, we didn't do stuff like that. So, so anyway, that's a bit of the legacy. This is a five generations long media conglomerate like the Newhouse family in New York, maybe the Bloombergs, maybe mm-hmm. who else would you compare? Well, obviously the Murdochs is the obvious comparison. Yeah. I mean, you, you had the Chandler family with the LA Times, uh, Salzburgers with New York Times, the Graham family with the Washington Post. I mean, yeah, you've got these newspaper dynasties. So yeah, it was that kind of level. Five generations sounds like a lot, especially to Americans, but your family is, five generations is just the most recent manifestation of its uh, prestige. How far back can you tell stories about your family? Well, that's a great question. So, you know, my ancestors originally came from England, from the county of Warwickshire, hence my first name of Warwick. There is sort of another branch of the Fairfaxes that came from Yorkshire that we probably related to, I don't know, 500 years ago or so. Uh, They were the Lord Fairfaxes, and one of them, believe it or not, owned most of what is now Northern Virginia. Hence, you've got Fairfax County for those in the D.C. area. And supposedly that particular Lord Fairfax gave George Washington a start in the army, helped buy him a commission, and he did some surveying work. And obviously, when the American Revolution was over, being a lord, he was kind of on the other side and kind of went back to England. And I guess that's what you do if you're a lord. 
Yeah, so there's some definitely famous ancestors going way back when. You even tell the story that Lord Thomas Fairfax was the commander of the parliamentary forces during the English Civil War, and Oliver Cromwell was actually under his command. The Ollinger, I can't help but compare myself here, Warwick, (laughs) because that's what human beings do. The Ollingers go back to the late 1940s in Mobile, Alabama. Before that, we can't trace our lineage any further, so... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe maybe it's better that way. I mean, these days, do any of us really want to know our lineage? Well, yeah. I mean, when you come from a prominent family, for whatever reason, you're curious about that. But yeah, it's kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, that particular Lord Fairfax in the English Civil War in the 1640s, he wanted democracy, but he didn't want to kill the king. So uh, Cromwell was a little puritanical and said, no, nope, yeah, we got to kill the king. And so, you know. There's always a more moderate way rather than the extremist approach. (laughs) Well, I mentioned all this stuff just to sort of paint the picture for our listeners of how you grew up. And indeed, three generations of your male ancestors had been knighted. Your dad, your grandfather, Sir James Oswald Fairfax, and your great-grandfather, Sir James Redding Fairfax. Yeah. Is it logical to presume that you were in line for the same honor? They were, you know, knighthoods by, you know, most recently by the Queen who knighted my dad in the 1960s. So it wasn't a hereditary But I didn't really do anything uh, worthy enough. And besides, I don't know if it was the 80s or at some point, Australia said, you know, why are we doing this whole British knighthood thing? (laughs) Aren't we a sovereign nation? And so they decided to stop. So I kid my wife, whose name is Gail, and, you know, she's American. And I said, look, I know I kind of blew it. You could have been Lady Gail. I'm so sorry. (laughs) So she's okay with it, you know? (laughs) She's stuck with you nevertheless. That's a statement to her her integrity. So sad. (laughs) So you grew up in an incredibly opulent environment. Your father was driven to work in a Rolls Royce every day to the family business. What was it like to be a child in those circumstances? It was kind of, I wanted to say crazy, but I know that's totally a podcast, but it really was in a sense, because really it was like growing up in maybe a Bush or Kennedy's. I mean, not only do we have money, but we were respected, you know, as pillars of the community that produced papers that didn't seek to favor, certainly not in the editorial, one party or the other, family of integrity. So you had money, prestige, respect. My mother, whose whole other story was quite the force of nature and very outgoing, she would throw parties for 300 like it was nothing. People would, you know, you had prime ministers, prominent business people, people from Hollywood come out. And their friends in Hollywood would say, you know, Lady Mary Fairfax, she'll throw a party for you like you're not used to. That's saying something (laughs) for Hollywood people. Right. I mean, you know, it's not so much in terms of the opulence, but, you know, maybe the style and just the thought that went behind it. And so, yeah, I mean, I was just exposed to just people with a lot of money and privilege. And then in terms of my own background, there was this expectation that I would go into the family business. So just this sense of pressure, I've got to measure up. And uh, it's interesting, uh, people from wealthy families, kids typically go in one of two directions. A common direction is parents are not always wise, give their kids Ferraris. The kids race around with fast cars and do drugs and life doesn't work out too well. That's sadly a very common manifestation. I was almost in a biblical sense. I was not the prodigal son growing up. Uh, I was the good son. I was the one that worked hard. I didn't do dumb stuff. I got good grades, did my undergrad at Oxford, like some other relatives, I worked on Wall Street, graduated from Harvard Business School. So I took life very seriously, which actually made it worse in some ways, because you don't always have a son or a daughter of a family like that, that is the quote unquote, good son or good daughter. So they just raised expectations exponentially. And it was all about, say, in the U.S. and the military, duty on a country. I've never Mm -hmm. been in the military, but it was all about duty. Yeah, had to fulfill my duty. You wrote that you felt scrutinized growing up. Yeah, I mean, when you grow up like that, if you do anything wrong, it'll be in the front cover of the newspapers, on TV. There's no margin for error. I just felt like I never wanted to let people in Back in my takeover days, which you know, we'll get to, people wrote an article in the equivalent to the New York Times Sunday Magazine, was one of those kind of things. The article said, you know, the man behind the mask, who is Warwick? He's inscrutable. What's he thinking? Because I was so afraid of letting anybody in that I was just 
yeah, I just wouldn't open up a whole lot. So that level of public scrutiny, I didn't want to do anything wrong and hurt my family. So I just, yeah, sort of like a, a blank slate, if you will. Who is he? Did you get along with the other kids at school? Did you feel like just a regular kid? Australia is similar to America, but in one sense, quite different. In America, there's a fair amount of prominent families. Well, I mean, you know, relatively speaking. In Australia, there's definitely money. But when I was growing up, you know, I went to a a good private boys' schools. I mean, most of the private schools back then were, you know, girls' schools or boys' schools. And so the other kids, their dads or parents might have been stockbrokers or lawyers or what have you, but they weren't even close to in the same league in terms of money or status. And Australia being a very egalitarian society, which in a lot of ways is good, if you're successful in anything other than sports, they kind of want to bring you down, you know? (laughs) Tall poppy, right? Exactly. Well done. Yeah. So it's like, oh, so, so you think you're better than us. So how many cars do you have? And my dad loved cars, so I stupidly answered the question. And, <laughs> what, was, you know, what was the number? I don't know, five, six. He had this Rolls Royce. He had a uh, 1928 Bentley. And he also had like a 65 Aston Martin, almost identical to the one that uh, James Bond drove in Goldfinger. He couldn't tell the difference. And that was pretty cool you know, doing, you know, <laughs> yeah, when my yeah. dad drove that. Yeah, that tall poppy syndrome, it's like, I felt like different than, I just wanted to fit in and be normal, but I was anything but normal. And so there was no group I could hang out with and feel like we're peers. It just didn't, at least in Sydney, it didn't exist for me, it it seemed. And when you got to Oxford and Harvard Business School, did you have imposter syndrome? Did you feel like you deserved to be there? Or was there some, was there always this need to prove yourself because of where you came from? You know, obviously, did it help having some ancestors go to the college I went to at Oxford, Balliol? It did, but it was a competitive entrance exam, and you know, you've got to, you know, be able to make it through there. But yeah, I guess I wanted to always prove myself to myself. When you grow up with money and privilege, almost like you get dessert before you've had, you know, the main meal. It's like I always wanted to prove that I worked hard and was humble. Never thought of myself as better than anybody else. So. I, I had a chip on my shoulder in that sense that I did not want to be some good for nothing son, like some other families. I didn't want to be that guy. I did not want to be somebody that was this sort of waste of space, good for nothing, child of privilege. That was not going to be me. So yeah, that was sort of a, almost like a anti-hero thing, like a negative motivator to me. I did not want to be that person. So hence I worked hard and took life seriously and tried to be humble and and all that. So, yeah. How did you find your way into the family business? I view it a bit like the British royal family. I mean, for Prince William to say to his dad or his grandmother, you know, I'm not really seeing that I want to do this. Maybe I'd like to paint or be an architect. I mean, that would be unthinkable. Look what's happened to Harry. It's not easy to get out. And so, you know, my dad was a reflective, philosophical kind of guy, not really a business guy. So he never had conversations saying, you know, you got to do this. He wasn't this tyrannical guy the way you can see on TV. But it would have just destroyed him if I said, look, Dad, I'm not going to go into the family business. I I mean, I loved him dearly. I couldn't have done that. So there was no conversation. It was just, this is what's expected. So I didn't grow up thinking, gosh, what do I enjoy doing? Do I like math? Do I like, Uh, it was like, what I want to do is irrelevant. Whether it was at Oxford or Harvard Business School in both places, you had firms come around recruiting. Like at Harvard Business School, you have investment banks and people like McKinsey and, you know, I didn't go to any of those prospective get-togethers. It was irrelevant. My path was set. It was foreordained. Did that cause you stress? Did you ever feel sorry for yourself because of those circumstances? You know, it was just, it was who I was. This was my destiny. And the thing that makes this different than maybe some other, you know, wealthy families, it's one thing if you're producing, you know, widgets or, you know, ketchup or whatever it is, nothing (laughs) wrong with that, you know, but we're producing quality newspapers. We had a duty to the nation to hold business people and politicians accountable. It was a sacred cause. So for me not to go in the family business, not only would I let down my family, but, you know, potentially in some weird proverbial way, the nation. It's like, it's my duty. So 
the stress was, how am I going to be able to measure up? Is normal and typical in large uh, wealthy families. There was obviously some level of dysfunction because money will do that to you, uh, left to its own devices. But there was infighting between different factions in my family going back decades. In 61, I tried to remove my dad as chairman after an ugly divorce. And then in 76, when I was 15 years old, they successfully, uh, other family members, removed him as chairman. So once that happened, I was then, certainly from my parents' perspective, seen as the heir apparent. So the expectations and the pressure, it's like, gosh, I've got to somehow maybe not redeem the family, but uh, carry on my dad's legacy. And, you know, there was feelings that management wasn't doing a good job, at least from my parents' perspective. Maybe the papers were getting more sensational. So I always felt like I had no choice. This was my duty and I was going to fulfill it. I might proverbially die trying. But my own desire in life was irrelevant. My needs and happiness was irrelevant. All that was relevant was doing my duty within the family and the family business. So I was just completely focused on that, bought into it. That was just in every fiber of my being. Duty, legacy, family business. That was it. And how old were you when you went full time at the family business? Well, yeah, I would have been 20. 26, when my dad died in early 87, and that kind of led to the huge crucible pivot point when I launched this $2.25 billion uh, taker of my family's business. As again, I had, you know, issues with how management, what they were doing. And so just to back up, so the family business was a public business. 50% of it was publicly traded and the other 50% was held by the family. And so we were in control, but there was the stock price of the company went up a lot in early 87. So the stock market felt like with my dad dying, that the company was in play with the right number. All you had to do was pick off a few minor shareholdings, get over 50% and would fall like a house of dominoes. That was the market's thought. From a global market sort of period of time, contextual standpoint, this is in the middle of the LBO, the leverage buyout craze, right? Oh, absolutely. There were, you know, big corporate raiders in Australia as they were here. And so that was an understandable fear. And so, yeah, I, with issues with management and company papers being a bit sensational in my crusading naive youth, I felt like something needed to be done and did this multi-billion dollar uh, takeover. So again, it was all about duty and uh, obviously in part because of emotions, maybe subconsciously what was done to my dad, removing his chairman is like, I don't know, 15 years before or so, who knows, but somehow I made just some cataclysmically poor decisions and assumptions. And it's funny, I know uh, one of your books is what you can learn from getting uh, an MBA or something, isn't it? Something like that. It's something like that. Yep. They don't Uh, teach these lessons at business school. I almost feel like uh, it's a, I know you're a comedian amongst other things. I just felt like I could have been maybe a chapter there because while I was in my last few months at Harvard Business School, I was doing classes during the day. And because of the time difference, talking to investment bankers in Australia at night, doing this takeoff, it was crazy. That's incredible. I made all these assumptions like, which a Harvard MBA should ever make these assumptions, that other family members involved in the, in the business wouldn't sell out, which of course they did. Who would want to be in a privatized company controlled by a 26-year-old? Mm. No rational person would. So how could a Harvard MBA... Oxford, Wall Street, make that decision. It's almost hard for me to know, but it's all the emotions are surrounding it. What happened to my dad clouded my judgment. So that in the October 87 stock market crash, we were in trouble by the end of 87. So uh, yeah, we was almost doomed to fade before I started. So yeah, I just made some monumentally bad decisions, but it was all wrapped up in duty and emotion and loyalty to my dad and friction between different family members and factions. And it was all like that produced some, you know, poor decisions. So under your watch and your direction, not to say there couldn't have been other things that happened had you not chosen this path, the other paths weren't clear necessarily, but under your watch and your direction and much based on your choice, a company that had been in your family for five generations, 150 or so years was no longer a Fairfax entity. What did that feel like? Well, it was awful. I mean, late 1990, you know, we had so much debt. Australia got in a big recession and newspapers cyclical. So it went under. 
My wife's American, so, you know, we uh, moved to the U.S. in early 91. It was crushing. You know, funnily enough, you might expect one of the big crucibles was losing a couple of billion or so. Interestingly enough, money has never been that important to me because I grew up with so much. I saw how money certainly doesn't always make you happy. Left to its own devices, it can corrupt, can corrode and destroy character. If you do nothing, that'll probably happen if you just leave it to its own course. But the biggest crushing moment was more or experience was feeling like I let down my dad, my parents, my ancestors, five generations, uh, you know, John Fairfax. And in some weird way, because the founder was a person of faith, I'm a person of faith that happens to an evangelical Anglican church at Oxford. In some sense, I felt like I'd let the universe or God down. There was some plan to resurrect the company and the image of the founder in terms of how people were treated. And it sounds all a bit weird and may not have been true, but it was just so crushing losing the family business. I feel like I was responsible for destroying a legacy. Now, the company continued. Other people bought it, but it wasn't controlled by the Fairfax family. And uh, that legacy was gone forever. So it was just crushing on so many levels. You became a celebrity, not in the way one wants to become a celebrity. <laughs> and you mentioned one of the op-eds or the articles about you. I mean, uh, people were saying all sorts of horrible things about you. Were you more concerned about what people were saying outside or how you felt on the inside? Yeah, I mean, the outside was was tough, obviously. Front page news, people find editorial cartoons funny. It's never funny when it's about you, <laughs> you know, I got to say. It's, it's never funny, I'm laughing with you, not at you. I've never seen an editorial car. It's always at you, right? Always, you know, at your expense. So I don't know, you know, hopefully that's not quite your love brand of comedy, I'm, I'm guessing. But there was one which had me as this Mongol, you know, Genghis Khan, Raider, you know, what took more than 100 years to build Warwick destroys in a day and my least favorite was, how do you start a small business? Give Warwick Fairfax a big one. In your defense, that's a hacky joke by whoever wrote that. <laughs> that is an old, you can say it for, how do you make a million dollars in the wine business? Start with a billion or, or in horses or whatever it is. So I'm with you on that one. That wasn't original enough. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, if this was, if you were judging a comedian on a, a, a comedy panel, you might not give that high marks for originality, right? It's like you need new material. Doesn't make it any <laughs> less painful for you, but but that- no, 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 it didn't. So yeah, I mean, it was less the external, it was more internal. I mean, I went through years saying to myself, how could I have been so dumb? How could I have been so dumb? How could I have assumed the family wouldn't sell? You know, it's like, why did I do this? And so the cycle of recrimination, it took years to get past. But yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, the self-recrimination was, was brutal. And how did you come to the point of forgiving yourself? That's a good question. I think, you know, when you go through a crucible, you either abandon your faith, values, and beliefs, or you cling to them more. It's a binary choice. There's no middle ground. So for me, much like a a man on a ship in a raging storm clinging to a mast, I sort of clung to my faith and I felt like I believe from my perspective, God loves all of us unconditionally. He didn't need my stuff. He doesn't need me in charge of some family and media business. I mean, our life is but a vapor. You know, you look in the thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, however long it is that human beings have existed. I mean, it's just it's just a, a nanosecond in time. So if there is some cosmological intelligence, and who knows, I don't think they're really too worried about that. But just that sense of, you know, he loves all human beings because of who we are. That was one part, having a wife that, Love me unconditionally. We weren't poverty stricken. Yes, a couple billion uh, less wealthy, but we were fine. My needs weren't great financially. And then gradually I found work that I could do and not screw up. It was tough in those early days. Imagine you have a resume that says kind of former media mogul looking for a job. <laughs> I mean, it was a job kill. It was like, but I'm humble. I work hard. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like all the other ones I've seen on TV. The yeah. CEO applying for the uh, barista <laughs> job is not going not gonna to land that one. No. And so I actually dumbed down my resume a bit, which didn't feel ethically that bad at the time, but eventually got a job at an aviation services company doing financial and business analysis. And 
you know, I'm analytical. So that was good. Uh, the fact that I was probably the lowest paid Harvard Business School graduate in history at the time didn't hurt my ego, got to say. It was a step. <laughs> I'm probably the lowest paid member of my business school class right now, <laughs> who actually has a job, presumably a job. But That's right. Yeah, yeah. You, you went to uh, Dartmouth Tuck School, I guess. So, so, yeah, you got, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think I remember at the time reading about um, somebody in my section at, at Harvard Business School that was CEO of Continental Airlines, you know, a few airline mergers ago. It's like, huh, CEO of Continental Airlines. Okay, <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> but comparison, as we all know, is death, right? Right. And that right. you don't know what's going on in that guy's personal life. Maybe his marriage is a disaster. Maybe his kid right. is an addict. Who knows what's happening with him or her? And that's that's so true. So I've learned a lot not see it that way. But yeah, gradually I made my way back, got into executive coaching, which is a great fit. And then um, probably the biggest point of where I, where I am now is I gave a talk in church in 2008, largest non-denominational church, talked about kind of my experiences and what I'd learned. And people said to me weeks and months after, you know, what you said weren't really helped me. So I thought, well, how could a former media mogul help anybody? But who could relate to that? But that led me to writing my book, Crucible Leadership. So each of those was baby steps as I was clawing my self-esteem back so that, you know, I didn't look in the mirror every day and say, you idiot, you moron. So it took a long time to forgive myself is sort of one way of answering the question. The book, as you just said, is Crucible Leadership. And you mentioned Crucible several times. Are you finding clients and people that are reading the book because they've had some kind of blown up personal life experience that they've got to rationalize? Yeah, I mean... Rationalize sounds like negative language. I mean, put into perspective and or find a way to move forward. Absolutely. Yeah, we have our own uh, podcast, Beyond the Crucible. And in the 75 plus guests that we've had, what's amazing is amongst, amidst the diversity, there's uniformity, which sounds like a strange concept in the sense we've had... You know, former Navy SEAL who was paralyzed in a training accident. We've had victims of abuse. As I've mentioned physical tragedies, financial tragedies, men, women, all races, backgrounds. And despite the tragedy, each of the folks we've interviewed has found a way back and the path back, despite the diversity of experience and background is the same. It really starts with making a choice. So, you know, maybe it's your worst day to day and, you know, what was done to you is unspeakable. What you did was awful. And you can't forgive yourself or others overnight, but just making a choice that I'm not going to just hide under the covers for the next 50 years and life will end eventually. You know, I mean, we all have an end date, you know, yeah. the pain will end. I suppose if you want to be morbid that way, but the other is to say, okay, this was awful, but how do I make meaning out of the pain and how do I contribute to others? And everybody I've talked to, on the podcast, by using their pain to help others, that's provided a level of meaning, a level of comfort and solace without exception. So there is a path back from tragedy and devastation. It's not easy. Most of the 90s were tough. I don't sugarcoat it, but one step at a time, there is a path back to making meaning out of tragedy, but it's, it's not easy and it's painful. Do you think playing armchair psychologist for just a second, I'll do it if you don't want to do it for sure. yourself. No, but no, I'm happy, yeah. At even the tiniest little level deep down inside of you, did part of you want to blow it up? That's a great question. I think you may well be right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite possible because this was sort of like a, a gilded cage, a gilded prison. The expectations, the infighting amongst family members, the power, the money. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, I had this weird kind of daydream. I've always loved America. I visited America before I went to college. American history was my favorite. I love history, part of history growing up. And I just would daydream about being in some small little town somewhere in America. Everybody knew each other. I'd come from a normal background. People were friendly. And that felt like this nirvana, this sort of idealistic Disneyland type of existence. And that's to me what I would have wished for rather than I envied people that grew up in normal backgrounds without all the power and money. You didn't have family members jockeying for position because who cares if it's just a regular family, maybe that'll happen. But if there's not a whole lot of money to fight over, I guess you can still fight over something, but at least 
you've got one thing that produces toxic relationships out of the equation. So yeah, I just wanted to be normal. And so in one sense, I mean, it was painful when it ended, but in one sense, it was a blessing as I've only recently begun to see. And did I do it deliberately? I don't know. Who knows what I was thinking, but maybe, maybe I wanted to make a blow up. I think that's psychologically possible. You know, my parents have both died in the past few years. And as we were cleaning out their house, this is while my mom was still alive. She was looking at all this old stuff that she had. They had plenty of resources when they died financially, but they didn't have a lot of precious things. There weren't jewels and loads of silver services and all this stuff. And she said, it's amazing how well everybody gets along when there's nothing to fight over. (sighs) That is so true. (laughs) That is so true. It's like money, you know, it's funny. The Bible somewhere says, Money is a root of all evil. In my Bible, I proverbially crossed it out and put in money is the root of all evil. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And I talked yeah. at length with uh, Pastor Andy Stanley about this. Yeah. The difference yeah, between yeah. those two things is, is money itself doesn't cause us to be evil. It's that relationship with it, the choice we make. And too many of us, and the reason why I want to do yeah. this podcast is because yeah. we just fall into the default mode that more is better and whatever I have to do to get more is justifiable. Right. And it's true. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's just, you know, in my notion, I've just seen it devastate, not just me, but just so many other family members. And when am I going to get my inheritance? And I'm waiting. And it's just people put their lives on hold. And it's just, is it possible to be happy with money? Yes, but it takes a lot of work. It's not, <laughs> it's not easy. It's like, is it possible to be healthy and fit without eating right and exercising? Well, probably not actually. Health doesn't just happen by accident. It takes a plan. It takes diligence every day. And, you know, having uh, money or wealth is the same thing. You got to tell yourself, I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not going to let it corrupt me. You know, you just, you just got to be very diligent and thinking differently. And it's just so easy when you have people try to carry favor with you and say, oh, you know, you're so amazing and wow. And at first, when people say you're incredible, you go, oh, yeah, I, I know where you're coming from. I've experienced a sustained bout, bout of, you know, sucking up and uh, toadyism or whatever expression you want to use. Eventually, it'll break you down. Because you start to believe it. Exactly. At first, you go, I know where you're coming from, but it's like, well, maybe even if you're coming from that angle, who cares? And it's just kind of fun to hear all this praise. So please, you know, uh, keep at it. I'll throw you a few crumbs if you just, you know, keep saying nice things about me, you know. I am ready to prove myself above those compliments. So (laughs) by all means, all you wonderful listeners, start telling me that. (laughs) Although the logical extension of that, the end of that is seeing yourself in a political cartoon in the newspaper. I'm not sure I want that payoff. No, exactly. And um, obviously, I know you've heard this before, but the whole legacy thing is that oft used analogy, but on your deathbed or at your eulogy, do you want people to be saying, you know, there goes Warwick, there goes Paul, you know, multi-billionaire, stop. Is that it? Right. It's like, you know, most we wanted to say, you know, loving father, loving mother, son, daughter, friend, helped his fellow men and women. I mean, Again, it's not an original thought, but it's sort of live your legacy today. And so for money, if you think money and wealth and fame is going to be your legacy in your dying moments, that's not what you're thinking about. Nobody is. Speaking of legacy, you write very lovingly about your father. And as you said earlier in this conversation, you believe he was well-suited to be a professor of philosophy, probably better so than to be a media executive. Right, And you talk about the presumption, the very serious presumption that you would end up taking over the family business. So what advice would you give someone with a vibrant, thriving family business wondering what to do with it when they're coming to the end of their lives, especially if they have children? Well, uh, this is probably not good advice, but if it's the children, I'd say, get out, leave, escape, don't do it. <laughs> but I am obviously clearly biased in that perspective. So I think what patriarch or matriarch, as the case may be, of a family business needs to do is to say, okay, you know, really identity is one of the key battles that people of wealth have to face. Is my identity in my fame, in my case, was our identity as a family in being a Fairfax, head of this massive dynasty with this huge influence in Australia in this respect. 
it's hard to escape that identity because in some sense, it wasn't all bad. We were respected for the good that we did. It wasn't like we were respected for the evil that we did. But I think as a patriarchal matriarch, you want to say to yourself, is my identity in my family business? Do I want to preserve it for the next generation? Maybe I started this business in my basement and garage and all that. And this is my whole life. Well, okay, great. You had a good life. But your identity should not be in your business. It should be in what you contributed to society, your team, your employees, maybe products you did that benefited folks. And so if your identity is in the right place, then it will be easier for you to have kind of the conversations with your kids saying, look, just because I've spent the last 30, 40 years doing this, you don't have to do this. You know, in fact, I'd rather you try something else. You almost want your kids to have to plead with you to go into it. It's like, The default should be make your own path, make your own way. This is a tough thing. You know, different people think differently. Do you give everything you have to your kids? Do you put it all in a trust? Do you give them like hardly anything? It depends on the situation. I don't know that I have a particular prescription for that, but that's a real issue that wealthy families face. But really, you want to free your kids. I mean, I've done this with my kids. My kids are like 30 down to like 23. I have three boy, girl, boy. So I just want you to be happy. I want you to do what you love. I don't have a family business anymore, thankfully, to hand down to them. But encourage your kids to be happy. They have their own path, their own legacy. Don't poison them with the whole, you've got to continue the family legacy. Now, if they beg and plead and they have a good attitude, I'm not saying you never say never. Left to its own devices, it'll probably screw them up. So you've got to work really hard to allow them to be in your family business and have it work out right. It requires having conversations that very few people have. It's very, very rare that a patriarch or matriarch will say to their kids, look, don't feel you have to do it. In fact, default is I'd rather you not do this. How many times have you heard that conversation? It doesn't happen often. Is there an, an amount of money that is too great to leave to one's children? Boy, interesting question. I think it really depends. I mean, I'm obviously blessed with my own kids. I've tried to instill in them values. If you have kids that work hard, that may be, you know, kind of take part-time jobs when they don't need to. That is the case uh, with my kids, which kind of blows me away. You know, various times that's happened. If you have kids that have a good attitude to money, that work hard, that are humble, you know, I don't have the same, I'm very comfortable, but not at the same level that my dad was. You know, if you have kids that kind of have a good attitude, that work hard and are humble, and you educate them, you've got good financial advisors, maybe trusts. I mean, I think it really all depends in part on your kids. It's like being a steward, faithful with a little, then maybe you can be faithful with more. So really growing up, if they've shown themselves to be faithful and diligent, then I think it's not really about the amount, it's about the character of the individual. Good parents can have kids that go off the rails. It's not always your fault as the parent. If you've got kids that do the fast cars, the drugs, it's probably not wise to give them $20 million without any strings attached. That's probably not a prudent choice. So it really, it's not so much the amount, it's about the character of your kids and maybe some of the systems you put in place, trust and advisors. That's more the issue. Lean into character and values with your kids and it will make life a whole lot easier with money. Well, the book is called Crucible. Is it Crucible or Crucible? I've heard it both ways. <laughs> well, it can crush you. So maybe that's a new word, crush and crucible. It's crushable, right? <laughs> the book is Crushable Leadership. Oh, that's actually, that's like a Gary Vaynerchuk book. Crushable <laughs> Leadership is Crucible Leadership. Embrace your trials to lead a life of significance by my guest, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, where can our listeners find out more about you? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. On my website, crucibleleadership.com, we post blogs regularly, also active on social media, on LinkedIn and Facebook. We have our own podcast, Beyond the Crucible, where we talk to guests about how they bounce back from their worst days. And we have our own assessment to help people figure out where they are on their own journey to being a leader. So yeah, those are some of the ways. Well, I really enjoyed learning about your story. I think you're very gracious to share it with us and with the rest of the world so that we can all learn that failure isn't the end. It can just be the beginning. So thank you for your time, Warren. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Wonderful to be here. 
Well, I don't know that I've heard a more interesting story than Warwick's, and it demonstrates a lot of the points that I am trying to bring to life on the podcast. And one is that money is only one part of life, and its presence doesn't necessarily mean that your life is happier than those who don't have as much money as you do. Sometimes you're just trading different problems. Certainly your problem isn't hunger, your problem isn't a safe place to sleep, but it brings with it other stresses that most people don't recognize. So I'm grateful to Warwick for sharing both insights into his unique background and being candid and vulnerable about the experiences in his life that were probably the hardest he's gone through. I think we can all learn a lot from that because maybe we won't do so in as spectacular way as he did, but we're all going to have to learn to deal with failure in one form or fashion. So let's get to takeaways. Maybe this is three, maybe it's one just said three different ways. But first of all, you're going to screw up You're going to make mistakes and you have to find a way to forgive yourself. You have to move on. And in the end, the only approval that really matters is that of your family, your close friends, and the people who love you for you. And failure sure seems to be a way to to filter out those fair weather friends from your real friends. So when you fall on your face, look around you and see who's there to pick you up. Those are your real friends. The takeaway continued. You can reinvent yourself. You have to decide what you stand for and judge yourself by those metrics. If you worry too much about what happened in the past or worry too much about what others think, not only will you not be your own self, but you will be miserable for as long as you continue to walk this green earth. And I was pleased to meet Warwick and learn his story. And again, grateful to him for sharing it with us next week. Very different vibe, but I've got an interview with my buddy, Rocky Dale Davis, who grew up in trailer parks. He is now kicking major butt in the comedy industry. He's got a very unique perspective on money based on where he comes from and his life experiences. And I know you'll enjoy the contrast between my old conservative, boring rear end and his uh, fear not move forward attitude. In the meantime, if you haven't taken a chance to rate and review Crazy Money, I sure would appreciate it if you did. Those things help people looking for a new great podcast to understand how excellent this one is. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Carano, make me sound smart. You know what I'm talking about. See ya.